Distinguished colleagues, before we start the, our meeting today, I would like to inform you about yet another hostile step um, undertaken by the host country, a step against the Russian mission. Just now, literally an hour ago, we were informed that from the Russian mission, 12 of its staff are being expelled. This is yet another gross violation by the host country of uh, the UN agreement with the host country of the Vienna Convention, and etc., etc. Et we have been saying for a long time that we need to start an arbitration procedure on the implementation by the host country of its obligations to maintain a normally functioning emissions and permanent representations to the UN. Unfortunately, this uh, arbitration to date has not uh, um, been uh, begun. We keep being told about the need uh, for diplomacy, diplomatic solutions, and at the same time, our opportunities uh, to conduct this kind of activity are being restricted. We deeply regret this decision, and uh, we'll see how um, events develop uh, within the context of this decision. We now have an unofficial meeting now, but I can see that the U.S. representative has asked for the floor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to take a quick minute. The status of the 12 diplomats you refer to, um, I don't think is really the proper subject for this meeting, especially given the gravity of what we're here to discuss, which is untold humanitarian suffering in the country of Ukraine. But I, uh, since you have raised the issue, I will just uh, ensure my colleagues that the step that the United States government uh, informed the Russian mission of today was taken in full accordance with the headquarters agreement that we signed with the UN, and that those diplomats that have been asked to leave the United States were engaged in activities that were not in accordance with their responsibilities and obligations as diplomats. So under Section 13B of the headquarters agreement, they have been given a request to depart this country so they do not harm the national security of the host country. And I look forward to taking the issue up, Mr. President, where it properly belongs, which is the host country committee. Thank you very much. Indeed, our meeting is not on this, but we do have our own opinion on this. And the explanations which I heard from the representative of the United States are not satisfactory to us. The 8,983rd meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is letter dated 28th February 2014 from the prominent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations addressed to the president of the Security Council, S-2014-136. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with the Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representative of Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in the meeting. Mr. Martin Griffiths, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, and Mr. Filippo Grandi, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. And I now give the floor to Mr. Martin Griffiths. Mr. President, uh, I speak to you from Geneva. And wherever you are in the world, we have all been watching the military offensive in Ukraine with a sense of disbelief and horror. As we feared, as we all feared, civilians are already paying the price. The scale of civilian casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure, even in these very early days, is alarming. Humanitarian needs are growing at an alarming pace. 
in the hardest hit areas, civilian children, women and men have been injured and killed. Homes have been damaged and sometimes destroyed. As of yesterday, the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights reported at least 406 civilian casualties, including at least 102 dead in these few days. The real figure could be considerably higher as many reported casualties have yet to be confirmed. We know, and we will hear, of course, much more from Filippo, that at least 160,000 people have been internally displaced across Ukraine, fleeing for safety. We know that figure is likely to be much higher, potentially a significant proportion of the entire population. And of course, as Filippo will tell you, we believe more than half a million refugees have been forced to choose to flee their country in search of safety. So families are separated. The elderly and people with disabilities find themselves trapped and unable to flee, not even able to get that small comfort. The picture is grim and could get worse still. Aerial attacks and fighting in urban areas are damaging critical civilian facilities and disrupting essential services such as health, electricity, water and sanitation, which effectively leave civilians without the basics for day-to-day -day life. Bridges and roads have been destroyed, cutting off people's access to critical supplies and services. The use of explosive weapons in urban areas carries a high risk of indiscriminate impact. This is a particular concern in places like Kiev and Kharkiv. Civilians will undeservedly suffer the most from these attacks on densely populated urban centers. It, it follows. All parties must respect international humanitarian law, take constant care to spare all civilians and civilian objects from harm throughout their military operations. A party should also, of course, avoid the use of wide area explosive weapons in populated areas. And the longer this goes on, the greater the cost will be for civilians. Children will miss school and face a greater risk of physical harm, displacement, and unimaginably severe emotional stress. Women so often disproportionately affected by conflict, as we have so often discussed in this chamber, will be at even greater risk of gender-based violence. And women and children may be exposed to other forms of exploitation. The economy of Ukraine could implode, which will further exacerbate humanitarian needs and create a ripple effect that travels far beyond Ukraine's borders. Already the upheavals in recent days are deepening a pre-existing humanitarian crisis. Eight grueling years of conflict in eastern Ukraine had already left three million people in need of humanitarian assistance on both sides of the contact line in the Donbass region. And it goes without saying that humanitarian needs are now much greater, much greater, including the large scale displacement to which I've already referred across and beyond the entire country and not only in one region thereof. Humanitarian workers are doing their best to respond. The UN has expanded its humanitarian presence in Ukraine. We shall continue to do so. We're working to ensure we can scale up our operations as quickly as possible. And we had been preparing for this for some time. I must say that for the last three days, however, our movements, the movements of our dear colleagues in Ukraine have been seriously constrained as a result of ongoing fighting and our inability to receive assurances from the parties to the conflict that humanitarian movements will be protected. And only this evening, I was, I was fortunate to receive the beginning of some assurances to that effect. We must hope that comes into reality. 
In the meantime, local organizations and institutions are doing, as usual, the truly remarkable job that they do in all such situations, responding to needs. Local NGOs and the Ukrainian and the Ukrainian Red Cross, excuse me, sir, are working tirelessly to support civilians and evacuation operations. Health workers working day and night to care for the injured. Aid organizations providing psychosocial support to traumatize children, delivering first aid kits. And we're all here. We're all here this evening, this afternoon to support their efforts. Today, our most pressing humanitarian needs are for emergency medical services, including sexual and reproductive health services, critical medicine, health supplies and equipment, safe water for drinking and hygiene, shelter and protection for the displaced. In all 119 organizations, partners, humanitarian organizations are operating in Ukraine able to provide some form of humanitarian assistance, though clearly stilted in these particular days. Right now, we know urgently need progress on two fronts if you want to reach more people with aid that they need, that they deserve. First, we need the assurances from parties to the conflict that humanitarian workers and movements will be protected, even during the most severe days of the conflict and not waiting for the conflict to subside. Even now, even today, even yesterday, we need to provide those, those protections to those workers to do the job that they want to do. Under international humanitarian law, all parties must allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of impartial humanitarian relief for civilians in need and must ensure the free freedom of movement of humanitarians, a point we have been making in many different ways in these past four days. Secondly, of course, we desperately need more resources. Tomorrow, the Secretary General will launch a humanitarian appeal for this crisis with two components. A three-month flash appeal for the situation inside the country and a regional response plan for the situation outside under the leadership of Filippo Grandi and his office. The Secretary General, alongside Filippo, our NGO colleagues and I, will all call on member states to show support with quick, generous and flexible funding. And cash will be a major source of delivery of humanitarian assistance in the particular circumstances that obtain in Ukraine. But this is certainly not enough. The lives of millions of civilians are simply at stake. We know from other recent conflicts how brutal, deadly and protracted urban warfare can be. We know how countries' economies can be devastated, infrastructure, investment, and development gains set back an entire generation. And we know enough to know that we do not yet know what it will be the consequences of the events that we observe today. These things should never happen in any country, anywhere. Every effort, of course, must be made to de-escalate the conflict. The hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian who have taken the decision to leave their homes to seek safety elsewhere in their country or beyond. And those, even more of them, who remain at peril for the loss of basic services, of pensions, of support, of the services their children need, of the safety of a day that may come and may not. I reiterate, finally, Mr. President, the Secretary General's call the only thing that we must all pray for, an immediate cessation of hostilities. Mr. President, thank you very much. Yeah, I thank Mr. Griffiths for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Filippo Grandi. Grandi. Mr. President, uh, greetings from Geneva. Today and uh, 
in recent days, you have heard that uh, the United Nations humanitarian organizations, together with their NGO partners, have remained in Ukraine. Let me start by saying how proud I am that we decided to do so, just like we did in Afghanistan a few months ago. But naturally, as we just heard, our colleagues on the ground, like the rest of the civilian population, are now caught up in this deadly conflict. Many of them were relocated, and military attacks might force them to move again. Yet, they're still striving to deliver help to people in need whenever a small window of relative security allows for humanitarian aid to be distributed. Working with partners, including especially national NGOs, often in extremely dangerous circumstances. But we know that we're not even scratching the surface to meet the needs of Ukrainians, including an unknown but surely very substantial number who have been forced to flee their homes over the past days. The situation is moving so quickly and the levels of risk are so high by now that is, it is impossible for humanitarians to distribute systematically the, the, the help that Ukrainians desperately need. I therefore echo as well the urgent call made by the Secretary General and just a few minutes ago by the Emergency Relief Coordinator and by others indeed. Civilians and civilian infrastructure must be protected and spared and humanitarian access must be granted for those delivering aid to those impacted by war. A failure to do so will compound the already extraordinary levels of human suffering. Mr. President, in addition to the grave situation inside Ukraine, and as Martin just uh, told us, hundreds of thousands are seeking refuge in neighboring countries. They need safety and protection, first and foremost, but also shelter, food, hygiene, and other support, and they need it urgently. As we speak, there are 520,000 refugees from Ukraine in neighboring countries. This figure has been rising exponentially, hour after hour, literally, since Thursday. I have worked in refugee crisis for almost 40 years, and I have rarely seen such an incredibly fast rising exodus of people. The largest, surely, within Europe since the Balkan Wars. Over 280,000 have fled to Poland. Another 94,000 to Hungary. Nearly 40,000 are currently in Moldova, 34,000 in Romania, 30,000 in Slovakia, tens of thousands in other European countries. We're also aware that a sizable number have gone to the Russian Federation. I want to commend the governments of receiving countries for allowing refugees access to their territory. The challenge to admit and register, to meet the needs and ensure the protection of those fleeing are daunting. But so far they have been met, though I am seriously concerned about the likely and further escalation in the number of arrivals. Mr. President, we may have just seen the beginning. So my message today is one of gratitude to the governments of Ukraine's neighbors, and also through them, my heartfelt thanks to the citizens of those countries, ordinary Poles, Hungarians, Moldovans, Romanians, Slovaks, and citizens of other European countries 
have undertaken extraordinary acts of humanity and kindness. This is the humanitarian instinct that is so needed in times of crisis. I encourage governments to continue to maintain access to territory for all those fleeing. Ukrainians, of course, but also third country nationals living in Ukraine, people there to work and to study. And in some cases, people that are in Ukraine as refugees, and all of whom are now similarly forced to escape the violence. At this critical juncture, there can be no discrimination against any person or any group. I'm aware that the, the European Union, its member states, and other governments have already provided countries receiving refugees from Ukraine with bilateral support, which I hope will continue. UNHCR, with its United Nations partner agencies and national and international NGOs, is present in all these countries and we are scaling up. We encourage host countries to avail themselves of our support and expert advice as they address the situation and uphold their international obligations. We're helping and can do more in areas like protection and registration, organizing reception capacity, providing emergency relief and cash assistance, and in identifying and responding to the needs of the most vulnerable, many of them women and children, including a growing number of unaccompanied and separated children. Mr. President, I regret to say that unless there is, as Martin said, an immediate halt to conflict, Ukrainians will simply continue to flee. We're currently planning, I repeat, planning for up to 4 million refugees in the coming days and weeks. Such a rapid increase would be a huge burden for receiving states and would no doubt stress reception systems and related resources. Like all countries uh, hosting refugees <clears throat> around the world, they cannot be left alone to shoulder this responsibility. I therefore welcome the support expressed by many European states at yesterday's European Union Justice and Home Affairs Council to activate the Temporary Protection Directive for people fleeing Ukraine. This would enable, if activated, immediate and temporary refuge in the European Union. It would also facilitate the sharing of responsibility for people fleeing Ukraine among European states. As Martin mentioned, we will launch the UN Humanitarian Appeal for Ukraine tomorrow for activities both inside and outside the country. Private citizens and companies from around the world have already offered extraordinary financial support through thousands of donations, over 40 million US dollars to UNHCR alone in a couple of days. And I'm counting on governments to do the same. And quickly, Ukrainians and countries hosting refugees from Ukraine cannot wait. Finally, Mr. President, a reminder that Ukrainian refugees, like all others, and please let us not forget the continuing plight of Afghans, of Syrians, of Ethiopians, of the Rohingya people from Myanmar and of many others. All of them never wanted to be refugees. They never wanted to be forced to flee their homes and they all hope to return to their country as quickly as possible. Mr. President, members of the Security Council, it is not very often that I, I get to brief the Security Council. 
Let me take this opportunity, therefore, to echo what I said to the Council the last time you invited me a few months ago, that humanitarian workers are courageous, resourceful, and experienced. But they cannot keep the pace of conflicts constantly growing in numbers and gravity around the world. I speak to you as a sixth night of anguish falls over Europe, struck once again by war, and as millions of innocent Ukrainian civilians huddled in bunkers, scrambled to board overcrowded trains and think with trepidation about the future of their children. Let me say, as an old humanitarian worker myself, that the responsibility that you have to ensure that eventually peace and security for all prevail over power struggles and narrow national interest has never been as urgent and as indispensable a task as it is tonight. If you fail, if we fail, it might be too late for us all. Thank you. Uh, well, that is I thank Mr. Grande for his briefing. I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Pre Mr. President, I thank Mr. Griffiths Griffiths and Mr. Grandi for their statements. The humanitarian consequences of the Russian offensive in Ukraine are tragic. The number of civilian victims, including children, continues to increase. Cities are being bombed. Civilian infrastructure is being destroyed. Around 500,000 people have been obliged to flee and take refuge in Poland, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia and Moldova. This figure continues to climb hour by hour. We hail the solidarity that neighboring states have demonstrated. Russia, a permanent member of this council, is violating the most essential principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Russia is trampling on international humanitarian law and human rights, it is riding roughshod over the Geneva Conventions. France reiterates its call for an immediate stop to hostilities, which must go before any peace talks. The protection of civilians, including children and humanitarian personnel, as well as civilian infrastructure, is an absolute priority. There is no compromise on this. We reiterate our call for safe and unimpeded humanitarian access to all people in need. We have a shared responsibility and a moral duty, that of assisting the Ukrainian population. France and its partners in the European Union stand firmly beside Ukraine and its population. The European Union has already announced 90 million euro in humanitarian assistance. France is also doing its part. It has just sent 33 tons of humanitarian assistance to Poland to help the Ukrainians and is preparing to ship over 30,000 tons of humanitarian assistance to Moldova. We hail the United Na Nations launching tomorrow of a flash appeal for Ukraine and a regional refugee response plan for Ukrainians. In the, uh, for Ukrainians. We call all member states uh, to provide f financial support, and we also welcome the Secretary General's appointment of Mr. Amin Awad as United Nations Coordinator for the Crisis in Ukraine. The European Union sanctions adopted against uh, Russia and Belarus will be implemented in full respect for international humanitarian law, and we will ensure that they have no impact on the humanitarian response. Mr. President. France, with Mexico, will present a draft resolution to the Council calling for full respect of international humanitarian law, the protection of civilians, and unobstructed humanitarian access 
in order to respond to the urgent needs of the U Ukrainian population. It will be brought to a vote very quickly. France hails the courage of the people of Ukraine. Within the United Nations and in every institution, France will continue to mobilize with its partners to support the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine, as well as the Ukrainian people. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now give the floor to Mexico. Uh, señor Presidente. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We thank uh, High Commissioner Grandi and Under Secretary Griffiths for their reports. The figures that were just shared with us and the scene described are the reflection of a humanitarian situation which is becoming increasingly grave as the hours go by. This is why, amongst other actions, Mexico and France will present a draft resolution which uh, overall uh, will seek a cessation of hostilities, the protection of civilians, and guaranteed access for humanitarian assistance. We deplore the fact that there are continued uh, clashes in densely populated cities such as Kharkov, uh, Kiev, Odessa, and others. The use of explosive weapons in populated areas is unacceptable. Mr. President, we are also very concerned at the fact that broad sectors of the population are deprived of electricity, water, and access to basic infrastructure. The communities that are becoming isolated are facing a lack of food and medicine. Health services should be conserved at all cost. We call for open air access to all humanitarian workers without restrictions so that they can provide services. As we have heard, hundreds of thousands of people have already been displaced both within Ukraine and as the refugees in neighboring countries. Although these figures are very preliminary in nature, they already are alarming. And uh, they are going to es escalate uh, very rapidly. We have to be vigilant when it comes to this increase in the days, weeks, and months to come. Perhaps even the years to come. We call for keeping the borders open, as has happened with great solidarity, so that all those seeking protection can find it, and so that the principle of non refoulement be respected. Although we recognize the right to, to legitimate self defense of countries, it is also concerning that there is a substantial increase in the flow of weapons and the impact that this flow will have on the civilian population. We acknowledge the efforts of the Secretary General, including the uh, creation of uh, the SERF, and we are grateful for the economic commitments that several states already have made. Ukraine needs international economic solidarity today in order to respond to its urgent humanitarian needs. Lastly, Mexico clearly calls on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, particularly the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the first additional protocol of 1967, as well as international human rights law. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, thank you. And I'll give the floor to Kenya. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank USG Martin Griffiths and High Commissioner Filippo Grandi for their briefings. I also welcome the participation of the distinguished representative of Ukraine. Mr. President, the humanitarian suffering in Ukraine is unnecessary and uncalled for. Kenya offers its condolences to the families who have lost loved ones to the conflict in the last few days. 
we regret the mounting casualties, the hundreds of thousands of internally displaced and those who are exiting Ukraine as refugees, and the growing damage to civilian objects and infrastructure. Mr. President, we commend the UN for swiftly stepping in to provide humanitarian assistance. We also commend Ukraine's neighbors for opening their borders to refugees. We give a special thank you to Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia for working with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to enable Kenyan citizens in Ukraine visa-free entry. Mr. President, in the unfolding emergency, there have been disturbing reports about the racist treatment of Africans and people of African descent seeking to flee Ukraine to safety. The media is covering these appalling incidents and several states have confirmed that their citizens are suffering such treatment. We strongly condemn this racism and believe that it is damaging to the spirit of solidarity that is so urgently needed today. The mistreatment of African peoples on Europe's borders needs to cease immediately, whether to the Africans fleeing Ukraine or to those crossing the Mediterranean. And we also need to be able to understand that there are actors who want to magnify this story for cynical reasons that have nothing to do with the well-being and safety of Africans. Mr. President, we are here to discuss the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. But if we are truly to hold to humanitarian principles, then we must broaden our view. The extensive unilateral economic sanctions that have been announced against the Russian Federation are almost certain to have serious humanitarian consequences. Their effect in total may even amount to a form of blockade. It is our contention that the peaceful means to settle conflicts advocated by the UN Charter do not include acts that may constitute collective punishment. We must also add caution that such considerable sanctions, rather than opening the path to peace, may lead to an escalation and broadening of the conflict. The only way out of this increasingly dangerous crisis is for prioritization of diplomacy to limit all military maneuvers and open the path to negotiation. It is still not too late to turn towards the good offices of the Secretary General, regional organizations, and bilateral efforts to de-escalate this dangerous crisis. Whether the conflict ends now or later with even more disastrous results, it will still require an appetite to negotiate a stable security order. At this moment, statesmanship is required, and we urge all leaders of involved states to embrace their responsibility. As I close, Mr. President, I reiterate Kenya's recognition of the inviolable rights of Ukraine to its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Under Secretary General Griffiths and High Commissioner Grandi, for your truly sobering briefings. What you've briefed only underscores, I think, what the Secretary General has said, that this is a moment of great peril and great tragedy. Thank you to your agencies, your teams, for answering the call to help Ukrainians in need during this dire hour. In a matter of days, Russia's unprovoked and premeditated invasion has unleashed vast human suffering across Ukraine. We need to address the displacement and refugee crisis that we've just heard described. We need to address the food security crisis, and we need to document and address all violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law. This council just heard the latest displacement numbers which have been rising by the hour in the last four days. First, it was 50,000 fled, then 150,000 fled. Now half a million people have fled. This does not even include hundreds of thousands displaced internally within Ukraine. And behind each of these numbers are real people caught in a humanitarian nightmare unfolding before our eyes. And the truth is, no one knows where it will end 
How many people will flee their homes? How many will need humanitarian assistance? How many will die? That is because we don't know when President Putin will end his war of choice against Ukraine. I want to thank the many countries and the people in the region who have opened their borders and homes to fleeing Ukrainians. The safety these people are providing underscores our common humanity during an otherwise dark moment of war. And I want to echo the calls of the United Nations Refugee Agency. We should help and welcome all those fleeing conflict without regard to race or nationality. Refugees are refugees, regardless of race or creed. Of course, not everyone can or will choose to flee, and those who remain in Ukraine must be ensured unobstructed protection and assistance. Four days into the invasion, our humanitarian partners have already identified cash, fuel constraints, volatile security conditions, and logistical challenges as key operational constraints affecting all aid delivery in the country. We also need to be very concerned by the hunger that Russia's invasion will cause. The World Food Program warns us that the food security impact of Russia's invasion will be felt far beyond Ukraine's borders. The Black Sea Basin is one of the world's most important areas for grain and agricultural exports. Vulnerable people from Asia to Africa and the Middle East will face greater levels of food insecurity as supplies are disrupted, as we are already seeing. An estimated 283 million people in over 80 countries are acutely food insecure or at high risk, and this conflict in Ukraine will only exacerbate situations already on the brink of starvation. This is yet another reason why hostilities must end now. Finally, we are gravely concerned by reports of damage to apartment buildings and schools, as well as significant infrastructure damage that has left hospitals and hundreds of thousands of people without electricity or water, while bridges and roads are damaged by shelling. Adherence to international humanitarian law is critical, including obligations related to the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure. Humanitarian agencies must be granted secure and full access to people in need of aid. Tomorrow, as we've heard, the UN will be launching a funding appeal, an appeal for this humanitarian crisis. For our part, the United States is already providing nearly 54 million U.S. dollars in additional humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. USAID has been airlifting and positioning relief supplies, especially needed to help older people, people with disabilities, and people displaced from their homes to face the winter weather. This is just the beginning, and much more is coming. We welcome the commitments and leadership from other nations to ensure life-saving assistance reaches those most in need. No matter what happens next, we must do everything, everything we can to help the people of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Mr. President, I would like to thank Under Secretary General Griffiths and High Commissioner Grandi for their sobering briefings and urgent calls to action today. The Russian Federation's unprovoked and unjustified further invasion of Ukraine continues to visit death and destruction upon the country and its people, inflicting enormous hardship and suffering. Ireland stands in unwavering solidarity with the people of Ukraine. They have shown extraordinary courage and resilience. This fresh onslaught comes on the heel of eight years of conflict in eastern Ukraine, which had already displaced over 1.4 million people who relied on assistance to meet their daily needs. The Russian Federation's invasion has created a humanitarian catastrophe, compounding the suffering of millions with a rapidly rising toll of internally displaced persons and refugees in need of humanitarian assistance. Millions of people in Ukraine are grappling with the humanitarian consequences of a war not of their making. Innocent civilians, including children, are paying the terrible price 
of conflict. In Kharkiv, Kherson and elsewhere, we have seen significant damage to essential infrastructure. This damage has left hundreds of thousands of people without electricity and water. It has deprived them of vital medical facilities, transportation services, and means of communications. This is unacceptable. Mr. President, the parties to the conflict must comply with international humanitarian law, including the obligation to attack only military objectives, the prohibitions against indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, and the obligation to take all feasible precautions in attack. Ireland is gravely concerned by the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, which carries a particular risk of causing civilian harm in violation of these fundamental legal obligations. We are particularly concerned by reports of indiscriminate Russian attacks and shelling in Kharkiv, causing death and destruction among the civilian population. The use of prohibited cluster munitions by Russian forces has been reported. If confirmed, this is a further damning indictment of its military aggression. Cluster munitions are by nature indiscriminate, and we condemn all use of these weapons in all circumstances. Ireland urges against attacks on infrastructure and installations, including nuclear power plants. Such attacks would have profound effects on the health of millions and render the surrounding environment uninhabitable for generations to come. Any armed attack on and threat against nuclear facilities devoted to peaceful purposes constitutes a violation of international law, including the principles of the United Nations Charter, Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, and the IAEA Statute. We also express our great concern at the deployment of weapons and armaments or conducting missile strikes directly from the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Mr. President, the Russian Federation must protect all civilians in Ukraine. We recall its obligations to respect international humanitarian law and human rights law. The safety of all humanitarian and medical workers must be ensured. Humanitarians must not be prevented from ensuring principal assistance is delivered where it is most needed and when it is most needed. Ireland and its EU partners are providing significant humanitarian support and we stand ready to do more. We commend our EU partners and Moldova for their generosity and solidarity in providing shelter to hundreds of thousands of people fleeing the war. They are deserving of our support in providing timely humanitarian assistance, especially to the most vulnerable, the elderly, the young and the sick. We appeal to all countries in the region to keep their borders open to all of those seeking safety and protection. Ireland is already providing humanitarian support, including core funding to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, as well as announcing a 10 million euro humanitarian package in recent days. When conflicts rage, unpredictable, even barely conceivable outcomes can become all too real. Threats to unleash forces that cannot be controlled, including threats of nuclear weapons, are utterly unacceptable. Ireland has long argued that nuclear weapons offer no security. Their use would cause devastation in the region and beyond, bringing a new blight on humanity for generations to come. That is not a prospect that any of us should be willing to contemplate. Mr. President, we urge the Russian Federation to immediately cease hostilities, unconditionally withdraw from the entire territory of Ukraine, and refrain from further threats or the use of force of any kind against Ukraine or any other member state. In sum, we urge Russia to turn away from war and choose the path of dialogue and diplomacy. This is the right path and the time to take it is now before any more lives are ruined or lost. Thank you. Спасибо. 
I thank you. I now give the floor to Norway. President, let me thank the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Martin Griffiths, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugee, Philippa Grande, for their frank accounts of the consequences of the Russian invasion for the civilians in Ukraine. We need your strong leadership in the response to this unfolding humanitarian crisis. Norway is stepping up our support to the civilian population in Ukraine. The government has announced it will provide up to 226 million US dollars to the humanitarian response. Let me start by underlining that Russia and Russia alone bears the sole responsibility for this humanitarian crisis through its unprovoked, unjustified and irresponsible military aggression, it has blatantly violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The parties to the conflict in Ukraine must comply with their obligation under international law, including human rights and international humanitarian law. They must ensure the protection of the civilian population in all of Ukraine. We demand that all parties ensure the respect for and protection for all medical personnel exclusively engaged in medical duties, their means of transport and equipment, as well as hospitals and other medical facilities. We are calling on parties to the conflict to protect all humanitarian personnel and ensure and facilitate safe rapid and unimpeded access to humanitarian aid for those in need. The space for neutral, impartial and independent humanitarian action must be restored and protected. Fight is, fighting is going on in and around urban areas with the use of heavy explosive weapons. We are deeply concerned about the long-term harm to the civilians, including children and civilian infrastructure, homes, schools, hospitals, water plants, and other civilian infrastructure is being damaged and destroyed. We are deeply concerned about the reported use of cluster munitions. Explosives remnants of war will continue to kill and injure even after the conflict ends, and they will prevent people from returning home, going to school, coming back to work, and rebuilding their communities. Hundreds and of thousands of civilians are fleeing the conflict. We commend the neighboring countries for keeping their borders open and for the great generosity and solidarity shown with people fleeing the conflict. The door to safety and protection must remain open to all those in need without discrimination. We will do our part, including providing support. This weekend, two media workers were shot and injured Journalists and media workers are civilians under international humanitarian law. The world relies on independent and truthful reporting of the events that are unfolding. The heroic efforts of Ukrainian and international press are incredibly important. We urge all parties to respect and protect the press, both on the ground and online. We demand the unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops from the territory of Ukraine to restore the respect of the Charter of the United Nations and international law and prevent further civilian suffering. Russia started the war in Ukraine. It can choose to stop it now. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Thank you, USG Griffiths and UNHCR. Grandi for those struggling updates on the catastrophic situation unfolding in Ukraine. Dear colleagues, with its unprovoked aggression, Russia is causing an unprecedented humanitarian situation in Ukraine on a scale that Europe has not seen in decades. We all know the toll of war. In every conflict, it is civilian populations that bear the worst of the consequences that pay the high price. Conflicts equal with innocent victims, destruction, displacement and refugees, severe human suffering. Those who initiate conflicts do know this. We heard that the situation is alarming. 
When it's your grandi mentioned staggering numbers of hundreds of thousands of people on the move in and out of Ukraine, and all this in a matter of days. Women, children, elderly, and people with disabilities are currently the most in need. As this aggression goes on, civilians everywhere in Ukraine are terrified of what awaits them when the rocket is going to fall on their roof or what other ways this absurd war will affect them. International law is clear. Targeting civilians and civilian infrastructure constitutes serious crimes and perpetrators must be held accountable. There is no justification for this war as there is no justification when bridges are destroyed, when, in, when infrastructure is deliberately targeted, when missiles hit residential areas. Dear colleagues, we're happy to hear that despite hostilities, the UN operation in Ukraine has expanded. We support a strong and reinforced presence of the United Nations and humanitarian partners on the ground. We support the safe, unimpeded access and protection of humanitarian workers and the deliveries to the areas affected by conflict. Our messages are clear. Civilian and civilian infrastructure must be protected. Security and access for humanitarian efforts must be guaranteed. Safe and unhindered access for humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and its people is and should remain a priority. International humanitarian and human rights law must be upheld, in particular the four, the four Geneva Conventions and their first additional protocol. Human rights violations and other crimes must be documented for the purpose of, a, of accountability. We commend all countries that are hosting refugees. As already announced last week by Prime Minister Rama, we are happy to shelter, to shelter Ukrainians forced to flee because of the war. Albania has joined the wide array of sanctions recently adopted by the, Uni the European Union. The airspace of Albania has been closed to all Russian operators except for flights conducted for emergency and humanitarian needs. We are working to provide assistance in military and hospital supplies to Ukraine. Dear colleagues, the decisions and actions of the coming days will directly affect the lives of millions of people. What is happening in Ukraine should not happen anywhere. We need peace, not war. We need friendship, not aggression. We are and will stand with Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank Under Secretary General Martin Griffiths and UN High Commissioner Filippo Grandi for their briefing. India remains deeply concerned at the unfolding developments in Ukraine, where the situation continues to deteriorate. Our considered call for immediate cessation of violence and an end to all hostilities is an urgent imperative. India's Prime Minister has advocated this strongly in his recent conversations with the leadership of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. We welcome the commencement of direct talks. We reiterate our conviction that differences can only be bridged through sustained dialogue and diplomacy. We also underline that all members have agreed on the principles, the UN Charter, international law, and on the respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. There is an urgent and pressing humanitarian situation developing in Ukraine. In such times of conflict, India attaches the highest pri priority to the safety and well-being of civilians, in particular women, children, and the elderly. We are of the view that core principles of humanitarian assistance should be fully honored. Taking into account the humanitarian requirements in Ukraine, my government has also decided to provide urgent relief supplies, including medicines, and these are being dispatched tomorrow. We remain deeply concerned for the safety and security of thousands of Indian citizens, including students, stranded in Ukraine. Our evacuation efforts have been adversely impacted by the developments on the ground at the border crossings. Given that the safety of Indian nationals is of paramount importance to my government, senior ministers from the Government of India 
are being deployed as special envoys to Ukraine's neighboring countries. We thank them for their cooperation at this difficult time. We stand ready to help those from our neighbors and developing countries who are also stranded in Ukraine and may seek assistance. We also support all UN humanitarian efforts. As reiterated yesterday, there is no other option but to return to the path of diplomacy and dialogue as the only way ahead. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President. And I start by thanking our briefers, uh, Filippo Grandi and Martin Griffiths. As a result of President Putin's decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, a country of 44 million people is now on the brink of humanitarian catastrophe. Whatever my Russian colleague claims, the world can see that Russia's indiscriminate attacks against men, women and children across Ukraine and its disregard for international humanitarian law. Missiles have rained down on Kharkiv with cluster munitions hitting residential areas and injuring residents. Disruption to supply chains has caused food shortages in Kramatorsk. The reckless bombing of an oil depot in Vasilkiv has unleashed toxic fumes in nearby communities. Violence in Kyiv has forced people to seek refuge underground with many thousands, including the elderly and disabled, unable to evacuate. And as we've heard from the UN, today hundreds of civilians have been killed as a result of the Russian invasion. My Russian colleague may try to paint the UN's reporting as hysteria. Just as they said, it was Western hysteria to warn of their impending invasion. But let's look at the facts. Half a million people have already fled to Poland, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, Slovakia and other countries. Seven million people have been displaced and that figure, as the High Commissioner told us, is rising exponentially. UN agencies and humanitarian partners have been forced to suspend operations. In this moment, as the High Commissioner said, of urgent need, the situation that the agencies face is impossible. The UK stands with the Ukrainian people during their time of need. Yesterday, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, announced $54 million in aid to help our Ukrainian friends. This latest assistance package brings the total amount of UK government aid pledged to Ukraine this year to $190 million. Last week, Prime Minister Johnson also announced the UK would guarantee up to $500 million of loans to Ukraine through the multilateral development banks. The UK will also participate in tomorrow's UN appeal. UK government experts have also deployed to the region to provide humanitarian support to those fleeing violence in Ukraine. But colleagues, we know that a humanitarian response is not enough to save the Ukrainian people from the disaster that Russia is inflicting on them. So our message today is simple. Once again, for the sake of humanity, we call on President Putin to stop this war and withdraw his, his forces from Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, let me thank USG Martin Griffiths 
and High Commissioner Filippo Grandi for their very sobering briefings, which unfortunately confirm the images we are seeing on the media. Ghana expresses serious concerns about the unfolding humanitarian situation in Ukraine. The briefings highlight the indiscriminate attacks in civilian populated areas, which have spread fear and panic among the population, who have also been forced into shelters and subways. Children and newborn babies have not been spared of this regrettable situation. Thousands of people have also been internally displaced, including Ghanaians and other nationals, with more than half a million people forced to flee to neighboring countries as refugees. Ghana calls for the immediate and unconditional cessation of the hostilities, which have resulted in the current humanitarian crisis and urges the parties to refrain from further attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure in accordance with international humanitarian law. We strongly call on the parties to grant unfettered access to humanitarian agencies and to guarantee their protection and safety. We also call for the safe passage of all civilians caught up in the war and who desire to leave Ukraine. In this regard, Ghana encourages neighboring countries of Ukraine to facilitate the free passage of persons fleeing the war without discrimination and provide them with humanitarian assistance, including medical care, in line with the principles of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality. We continue to urge the parties to accept the path of peace and seek an early resolution through dialogue and diplomacy. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank the Under Secretary General Martin Griffiths and the High Commissioner Philippa Grandi. I thank them for their very uh, informative briefings. I welcome the participation now in discussions of the permanent representative of Ukraine. Mr. President, our message on the situation in Ukraine is clear. We do not want a war against a United Nations member state. Our message against a humanitarian consequence of the war is equally clear. My country is very concerned by the attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure. We call on the belligerents to refrain from any and all use of the weapons whose impact would be indiscriminate. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the population who are victims of the war they didn't choose, the war they did not provoke. And we ask, therefore, that humanitarian assistance be supplied um, to the population in need uh, without discrimination or hindrance. We, therefore, commend the generosity shown by the neighboring countries to Ukraine who are hosting the people who are fleeing the war. Mr. President, I would like to echo the note of alarm as regards the African students, including some from my country, who are fleeing the war in Ukraine and in, are encountering this process a discrimination as a, as a seeking to flee and for refuge. We've received several reports of racism. This is unacceptable. We ask for the respect of the dignity and for an equitable treatment of all people in dire circumstances. It is the opportunity for my country to recall the African Union appeal for the respect of international law who requires equal treatment for all people who cross international borders in conflict areas. Mr. President, the humanitarian disaster and the distress of the people can only stop if the hostilities stop. And that is why we reiterate our appeal for an immediate ceasefire and de-escalation. There has to be a humanitarian response on the scale with the needs in Ukraine and neighboring countries. The appeal launched, that will be launched by the Secretary General tomorrow for humanitarian assistance is therefore very timely. To conclude, 
I would like to say that my country urges the international community to show empathy and support all the victims of war without discrimination by nationality or race. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Said Rais. Mr. President, at the outset, I would like to thank Mr. Martin Griffith and Mr. Filippo Grandi for their briefings. Mr. President, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine has deteriorated significantly in recent days as the continued fighting results in damages to civilian infrastructure and civilian casualties and deaths. According to UN reports, hundreds of thousands of people are suffering because of the great because of a great shortage in essential services furthermore many homes were damaged or destroyed while residents numbering in the hundreds of thousands are becoming displaced or seeking refuge in neighboring countries all civilians who are seeking refuge must be able to do so freely and without being subjected to racial discrimination. In light of the crisis in Ukraine, we stress the importance of focusing on the deteriorating humanitarian situation of all civilians, including by working to ensure the protection of civilians and preventing the disastrous humanitarian situation from escalating beyond our ability to address or contain. For its part, the UAE is looking into the humanitarian needs for Ukraine. Based on our consistent efforts to alleviate the suffering of civilians suffering from the conflict, we deplore the ongoing violence in Ukraine and reiterate the need for restraint, for a ceasefire and a peaceful resolution of the conflict. The continuation of the fighting will lead to further losses among innocent people, in addition to worsening the humanitarian situation, which is exacerbated by the extreme temperatures this winter as civilians are fleeing the crisis, seeking refuge and safe havens. In addition, we urge all parties to implement their obligations under international law, including by allowing humanitarian aid to reach those in need and to refrain from targeting civilians. We also reiterate the need to comply with the principles of international law and the Charter of the UN, especially respect for the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of states. These principles, upon which the United Nations was founded, apply to all member states, regardless of their resources, capabilities, or geographical size. In conclusion, my country reiterates the importance of working to reach an immediate ceasefire and seeking peaceful solutions that serve regional and international security and stability. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank the briefers for their informative presentations. Let me also take this opportunity to express our solidarity to all families who have lost someone in this war, to all people left without home, water, and electricity, to those who are fleeing in fear, sometimes with nowhere to go, and to everyone who is now trapped in a conflict zone desperately attempting to find refuge. I wish to commend all personnel that are now in Ukraine trying to alleviate the suffering of the population. We know 
that you are doing your best in very challenging circumstances. And we know that more could be done to assist, to assist you in your efforts. As we speak, hundreds of thousands of civilians have already fled Ukraine. Many more will certainly follow, millions perhaps. Most hostilities are being conducted in densely populated areas where the risks of civilian casualties increase, including children, particularly with the use of explosive weapons. Civilians are being called to join the fighting, possibly with no proper training. There are pressing humanitarian needs for medical services, medicines, health equipment, shelter, and protection. Brazil calls all parties to fully respect international humanitarian law and uphold at all times the principles of distinct, distinction, proportionality, precaution, necessity, and humanity. It is of paramount importance to ensure the protection of civilians and of critical civilian, civilian infrastructure, as well as to ensure unhindered humanitarian access to all those in need and the protection of refugees and displaced persons. We also reiterate our appeal to Ukraine and Russia to facilitate the withdrawal of all persons who want to leave the Ukrainian territory. Brazil expresses its gratitude to Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Moldova, Romania, and others who are facilitating the exit of people fleeing the conflict, including Brazilians and Latin Americans. Mr. President, for international humanitarian law, it does not matter how a war came to existence or who was responsible for it. What matters is to spare civilians and maintain a minimum of humanity in, in an already inhuman situation. So beyond any discussion in the Council on the reasons for this war, we can and we must come together to adopt measures to minimize the humanitarian impact of the conflict. This is the minimum that we can do. In moving forward, it's important to closely monitor the situation on the ground, the number of civilian casualties, and the immediate needs of the population. At the same time, there is no doubt that the best way to protect civilians and avoid a humanitarian crisis is to prevent conflict and, when it erupts, to immediately cease it. Any war will generate devastation, death, chaos, and fear. The greater the escalation, the higher the risks of human suffering. In the past few days, permanent members of the Security Council, the ones that bear the greatest responsibility for maintaining international peace and security have been open, openly referring to severe unilateral sanctions, military actions, and nuclear forces. This must stop. We need the world, we need, the world needs these escalations to stop and dialogue to resume. The severe economic sanctions being imposed might have rippling effects in the world's economy, with consequences felt way beyond Russia. Possibly, the population in developing countries will be the ones that will suffer the most. The supply of arms and increasing militarization of the region will hardly promote dialogue. It will probably provoke more tensions. As we have seen reports on nuclear forces being put on high alert, I would like to recall what the International Court of Justice has once said about nuclear weapons. They have the potential to destroy all civilization and the entire ecosystem of the planet. 
and their threat of, or use would generally be contrary to the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict. Any use of nuclear weapons would have unacceptable humanitarian consequences for present and future generations in the territory of Ukraine and beyond. So far, we have received reports of around two or 300 of civilian casualties in Ukraine, which is already devastating. If a party resort to a weapon of mass destruction, what will be the number of deaths? What will be the extent of destruction? We have seen that before, and we hope, we plead to everyone involved that we do, we do not see that again. I thank you. As he was I thank you. I now give the floor to the representative. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would like to thank USG Griffiths and High Commissioner Grand Grundy for their briefings. What is now unfolding in Ukraine is indeed heart-wrenching. We call upon all parties to exercise restraint, de-escalate the situation, and avoid civilian casualties. The safe and the safety and the security of life and the property of all civilians, including foreign nationals, and their humanitarian needs should be effectively ensured. It is of the utmost importance to prevent a large-scale humanitarian crisis. We welcome the remarks by the Secretary General where he indicated that the United Nations will play an active role in coordinating the humanitarian assistance. In our view, the United Nations and the international community should provide humanitarian assistance in accordance with the principles of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality as set forth in GA Resolution 46-182 in order to avoid politicization of humanitarian activities. Mr. President, what remains most important for the time being is to return to the track of diplomatic negotiations and a political settlement as soon as possible and to promote a de-escalation of the situation. China supports the holding of a direct dialogue between Russia and Ukraine, which is the ultimate way out of this crisis. The international community should provide favorable external conditions for dialogue and a political settlement and avoid exacerbating the situation. Any action by this Council should place it in a better position to play a constructive role rather than leading to further escalation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of the Russian Federation. We listened very carefully to the briefings by Martin Griffiths and Filippo Grandi. The situation in Ukraine is, of course, uh, the kind of situation that uh, gives rise to most serious concern amongst all of us. We can see that the ordinary people are suffering. The people who basically um, ended up being hostages by, uh, held by the Ukrainian radicals and nationalists who are clinging to power at any price. Now, why am I saying this? Because in those uh, territories which came under the Russian armed forces control, the people are not encountering acute humanitarian issues. The local authorities, after the radicals have left are working normally in providing all the necessary services to the people. The uh, life-providing services to the people are functioning. The acute uh, issues are only uh, remain in those towns uh, where the Ukrainian authorities issued a criminal and responsible order to distribute arms to anyone who wants it, including criminals, the criminals who was who were let out of, of prisons for that specific purpose. And this resulted in mass instances of robberies and, and uh, killings and looting. There's plenty of information about that in social networks. The, nation, nation, the social networks also have appeals from a number of heads of administrations calling on the Ukrainian authorities to stop this madness. We also note that there is many instances where later on the victims of the looters and gangsters are shamelessly presented as having perished at the hands of the so-called Russian infiltrators. We address the people in Kiev 
held by the radicals in the city as a human shield. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirms that all those peaceful citizens of Kiev can leave the capital of Ukraine without hindrance via the road kiev Vasilkov. This road is open and safe. Let me repeat it once again that the special military operation conducted by the Russian armed forces does not have the goal of occupying Ukraine or harming the local population. Demilitarizing the country which is crammed with NATO weaponry is aimed at protecting the long-suffering people in Donbass and Ukraine. The special operation conducted by Russia does not impact critical civilian infrastructure. Over the five days of the operation, there hasn't been a single documented case of targeted destruction or no evidence of the death of civilians caused by the Russian military. And we're constantly being told the opposite, referring to some kind of credible reports. Despite the fact that currently in the information area there is a huge number of fakes, the kinds of fakes that people are trying to place on us, the blame for what is being done by Ukraine itself. And this tide of dirty lies replic replicated in Western mass media, unfortunately, very unfortunately, have become a dangerous mark of our times. Today, at this meeting of Security Council, once again we heard about the bombings of residential areas, hospitals, schools and kindergartens. It is reliably known that the Ukrainian radicals are placing their attack weaponry in residential areas, which is a direct violation of international humanitarian law. We would ask Martin Griffiths and Philip Grandi to please comment what I've just said. Everyone knows very well that um, starting in, in 2014, Russia and Russia alone basically extended assistance to the peaceful people in Donbass who were encountering relentless shelling by the Ukrainian army and the blockade by Kiev. We already had several meetings of the Security Council where we explained this approach of ours, and I'm not going to repeat this. I will simply say that we deeply regret the fact that even today, when we're discussing the humanitarian situation in Ukraine, not a single Western colleague mentioned the citizens of Donbass, who's suffering for eight years, you've tried not to notice. It's very, a very important measure of supporting the people of Donbass was a decree issued by the President of Russia, Mr. Putin, in 2019, entitled On Defining for Humanitarian Purposes the Categories of People Having the Right to Apply for Russian Federation Citizenship Under a Simplified Procedure. At the time when the people in southeast of Ukraine were basically pushed to the brink of survival by the criminal authorities in Kiev, who organized a socio-economic blockade of Donbass. In this situation, providing them the Russian citizenship allowed them to receive social allowances, pensions, salary, as well as education and healthcare services. Currently, in Russia, we have more than 110,000 refugees from Donbass. They had to leave their homes after an event a week ago when Kiev tried to yet once again resolve the Donbass issue militarily in violation of the Minsk package of measures. And the blame for this situation also belongs with our Western partners who openly indulged Kiev in Kiev's rejection of Minsk and pumped the country full of weapons. Overall, according to the information we have since the beginning of conflict in 2014, about 3 million Ukrainian citizens left for Russia. In conclusion, I would like to underscore yet once again that Russia did not start the war, that Russia is trying to end it. The Ukraine started the war in 2014, except that all these years you tried not to notice it. It was very odd for us to hear from the representative of France that the European sanctions on Russia do not violate international humanitarian law or the interests of the ordinary people in Russia. These duplicitous statements are something that we heard before in the context of other countries' situations. As regards the uh, draft proposed by France and Mexico the, on humanitarian situation in Ukraine, we need to study the text very carefully before issuing any assessment thereof. In any event, 
please know that the Russian military will provide any needed humanitarian assistance to the Ukrainians in the territories that have been freed from the radicals. I now resume my function as President of the Council and give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Distinguished members of the Security Council, Mr. Under Secretary General, High Commissioner. First of all, I would like to thank the Security Council for addressing this urgent issue. Every new day of the Russian unprovoked war against Ukraine increases the human sufferings across the entire country. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the Secretary General for his powerful statement and relentless engagement with the situation in my country. The Ukrainian government welcomes the appointment of Mr. Amin Awad as Assistant Secretary General to serve as UN Crisis Coordinator for Ukraine. As I know, he has arrived to Geneva and resumed his uh, duties. His mission will be extremely difficult against the backdrop of the ongoing Russian military activities that are often equal to war crimes. At the same time, millions of Ukrainians will require his attention, in particular our children, women, elderly, and other vulnerable citizens. So I wish him and his team strength and mercy in their walk. Distinguished members, let us be clear, this is not only a security crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis. This war of choice is not only a violation of international code, it violates the conscience of the world. Security assistance is needed, but it alone is not enough. We call on the international organizations to provide us with humanitarian assistance. We call on you to register all cases in which international law and international humanitarian law are violated. Almost all speakers and briefers today were unanimous in their assessments. The situation in Ukraine could deteriorate sharply. Let me provide you with the latest um, available information from the government of Ukraine. Today is the fifth day of a full-scale, unprovoked and unjustified war launched by Russia against Ukraine. Launched by Russia against the very heart of Europe. Launched by Russia against the idea and Id ideals of democracy. It is the most horrible and large-scale invasion since World War II. In the morning, I told the General Assembly about the shellings of the residential city of Kharkiv by Russian grads, killing and wounding dozens of innocent civilians. Now the residents of Kiev, the home of three million innocent people and its suburbs, are sitting within Russian crosshairs right now. According to Ukrainian Health Minister Viktor Lashko, as of today, over 352 people, including 16 children, were killed, and about 2,040 people, including 45 children, wounded. Russia keeps uh, attacking kindergartens and orphanages. Russia is attacking hospitals. Russia is attacking mobile medical aid brigades with shell fire and sabotage groups. Russia fired an ambulance crews near Zaporizhia and Kyiv. Let me say that again so that you can see this image in your mind. Russia is attacking hospitals, mobile aid brigades, and ambulances. This is not the action of a state with a legitimate security concern. This is the action of a state determined to kill civilians. There is no debate. These are war crimes. These attacks violate the Rome Statute, and these attacks are far from over. That is why I say this is a humanitarian crisis. 
As we see here, Russian missiles are aimed at destroying critical infrastructure, which could lead to a serious environmental disaster and even radioactive contamination. International humanitarian law is, is crystal clear. None of these facilities are legitimate military targets. The civilian population of Ukraine is the first to suffer from such attacks. And if we do not act today, it will be far from, from the lost. We welcome the statement issued today by the ICC prosecutor, Karim Han, on the situation in Ukraine. The statement about his decision to proceed with opening an investigation. In his statement, the ICC prosecutor says that he reviewed the office's conclusions arising from the preliminary examination of the situation in Ukraine and has confirmed that there is a reasonable basis to proceed with opening an investigation. In particular, he is satisfied that there is a reasonable basis to believe that both alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity have been committed in Ukraine in relation to the events already assessed during the preliminary examination by the office. Given the expansion of the conflict in recent days, it is his intention that this investigation will also encompass any new alleged crimes falling within the jurisdiction of his office that are committed by any party to the conflict on any part of the territory of Ukraine. The prosecutor will also be asking for the support of all state parties and the international community as a whole, as his office sets about its investigation. He will be calling for additional budgetary support for voluntary contributions to support all our his, uh, situations and for the loan of gratis personnel. The importance and urgency of the prosecutor's mission is too serious to be held hostage to lack of means." End of quote. To my colleagues from around the world, this affects you too. Russian military aggression kills not only Ukrainians, but threatens thousands of foreigners who are staying in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government is doing its best to facilitate their passage at the state border. Even as the border has become overwhelmed with the massive influx of people fleeing Russia's armed aggression. Temporary volunteer assistance points have been set up at the border to provide foreign students with food and cater for other humanitarian needs. Please do not be misled by Russian disinformation. There is no discrimination based on race or nationality, and if there, if there are cases, they should be investigated. Journalists working in the free press also are under fire during live reports from the scenes of action and hot spots. A journalist and a photographer working for the Danish newspaper Extra Bladet were injured when their car was targeted in Akhtyrka district of Sumy region. Ukrainian children are crossing the EU-Ukraine border without their parents and without powers of attorney from their parents. In this regard, we request decision makers in the EU countries to provide clarifications and instructions to EU institutions in order to secure free movement of and assistance to such underage persons and their guardians. According to the Ministry of Education of Ukraine, more than 350,000 school children have no access to education. Schools are closed due to severe insecurity in civil areas across the country. The numbers of refugees are being assessed. The numbers could be hundreds of thousands of people who have been forced to flee across international borders into neighboring European countries, mostly Poland, Slovakia, and Romania. It can take several days of waiting to cross the border, and we are grateful that more checkpoints on the border with Poland have been opened, including two additional pedestrian crossings for all who want to get from Ukraine to the neighboring safe country. Kyiv local authorities have set up a coordinating humanitarian headquarters to provide food and basic necessities to those in need. 
An electronic platform will be launched tomorrow. On this, plat on this platform, businesses will be able to provide information about their available resources and Kiev residents will be able to announce their needs. All of this information will be system systematized for e effective communication and distribution of essential goods. Olga Stefanishina, the Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, who has been appointed as a government coordinator for uh, humanitarian assistance working 24-7. There are many urgent things to do, like to agree on humanitarian corridors to evacuate civilians from the most endangered territories. However, I need to warn you not to be misled by Russian assurances of security. Russian wars often, if not always, do not match their deeds. For instance, just recently we heard Russian politicians and diplomats, even here in this chamber, who said that there would be no invasion, no attacks on Ukraine. Hence, these corridors can be easy targets to the Russian army. To help people at the border, crossing points in western regions of Ukraine who are waiting for crossing for at least one to two days to provide assistance to IDPs in western regions of Ukraine, including housing, schools, jobs, to provide humanitarian aid to civilians who remain home and now, we are, and now are cut off from markets, including in the occupied territories. Distinguished members of the Security Council, this is, this is not only a security crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis, as I said before. The Russian war against Ukraine has brought the entire region to the brink of humanitarian catastrophe. Let me therefore repeat our call to the international organizations to provide all possible humanitarian assistance and to register all cases in which international law and international humanitarian law are violated. You have all heard the lies from the Russian side, lies in Moscow, lies in the General Assembly, and lies in the Security Council. Distinguished members of the Security Council and friends around the world, do not listen to Russian lies. Listen to Ukraine's cries. Listen to the cries of men, women, and children who have lived in peace, who deserve to remain in peace, who and who will forever support your own nation's efforts to, for peace across Europe and around the world. Russia has tried and failed to defend its lives, but the people of Ukraine, with the help of the world, will never fail to defend our land. Do not listen to Russia's lies. Listen to Ukrainian cries. We need your help. The Russian ambassador laments that a dozen of Russian spies won't be able anymore to enjoy all the benefits of American life while doing things incompatible with their status used as a cover-up. The Russian ambassador should instead work hard to report to his superiors that only his cronies, a bunch of cronies, buy his narrative here in the United Nations. I want to conclude with saying that I'm looking forward to midnight, even though the midnight is the most dangerous time right now because that's when the most of the attacks take place. But I'm looking forward to midnight when this abomination occupation of the seat of the president of the council will be over. I thank you. I would like to now give the floor to Martin Griffiths and Philippa Grandi and ask them to answer the question that we put when we made the statement about the placement of heavy weaponry in residential areas uh, in uh, Ukrainian towns and how is this in line with international humanitarian law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me um, respond to that, uh, if I may, or try to. I can say that we have no confirmation of 
such reports uh, of um, radicals placing such weaponry in residential areas. Um, the fact is that accountability at this stage for breaches of international humanitarian law, which we must see in time, is naturally at this level of the conflict and this level of the violence at this level of the uncertainty, very difficult to establish. We are truly in a period of a fog of war, a fog which obscures the futures of so many people of Ukraine. I made a number of points, uh, I would add, in, in my remarks, in my briefing, about our fears of the impact on civilian objects, civilian infrastructure, um, as a result of urban warfare. I mentioned, for example, Mr. President, our uh, 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 re reminder that uh, large-scale urban warfare also requires the need to avoid the wide area explosive weapons. We are very, very concerned at what we're seeing now in the streets of some of the key large modern cities of Ukraine, the way in which people are voting with their feet, uh, the way in which uh, basic services are being interrupted, and the way in which civilian infrastructure is being damaged. And we will, in time, I am quite sure, discover who did what and who broke which requirements of international humanitarian law. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. No, I wanted to ask Philip Grandi. Do you want to take the floor? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. President. I fully support what uh, the Under Secretary General just said. Thank you. Uh, there are more no more names ascribed on the list of speakers. But before adjourning the meeting, I would like to say that whilst. Uh, Listen to our briefers. I was surprised because just the reports and videos and information in Ukraine, some of them are taken as fact and others, which are obvious, uh, the ones that we have in the in internet are fully reliable, unquestionably re reliable, are being considered well, inaccurate, unreliable, are considered not to be verified. Well, we're going to um, have uh, drawn lessons from that, and, uh, and we expect that the UN leadership will tell us how the Ukrainian activity considered. There are no more names inscribed, as I said, but before adjourning the meeting, as this is the last scheduled meeting of the Council for the month of February, I would like to express a sincere appreciation of the delegation of the Russian Federation to the members of the Council and the Secretariat for all the support that they've given to us. It was a busy month. We managed to get to consensus on several important issues within our purview, although, as you know, not on everyone. I would like to once again thank all the representatives of the Secretariat, including the conference uh, services, interpreters and translators, verbatim reporters and security staff. Our presidency is coming to an end and I know I speak on behalf of the Council in wishing the delegation of the United Arab Emirates good luck in the month of March. The meeting is adjourned.